Welcome to season four of the Photo Ethics Podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center. Each week, I'll be talking with an accomplished photographer about the ethics of their practice. Today in episode number nine, we'll be talking with Shaminder Dulé about troublemaking. Shaminder Dulé is a 13-time Emmy-nominated, award-winning video and photo journalist, visual editor, writer, educator, curator, and creative technologist, with over 20 years of experience producing stories for newspapers, magazines, TV, digital newsrooms, nonprofits, and startups. He crafts journalistic narratives with intimacy, immediacy, and impact that live beyond the daily news cycle, empowering communities to make informed choices and understand complex issues with empathy. He's a Pointer Fellow, an International Center for Journalists Fellow, a Hearst Fellow, and was a finalist for the Knight Mozilla Fellowship, the JSK Stanford Fellowship, and the Harvard Neiman Fellowship. He's led departments at NBC, Newsweek, PBS Seattle, Amazon, YMCA, and has worked on teams at the New York Times, the Daily Beast, Hearst Newspapers, and more. He was an instructor for new media narratives and a faculty member with the International Center for Photography. He's a co-founder of Stateless Voices, a co-founder of Reclaim Photo, and founder of Photo Walk Cities. Could we start with you just telling us a little bit about the kind of work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, first, let me just say thanks for having me on the, the podcast today. And um, I'm really looking forward to our chat. Uh, yes. Yeah, so for my story, I these days I do a lot of photo editing, a lot of consulting with uh, younger photographers. Mostly I've been very interested in mentoring and students uh, the last couple of years, working with a couple of different organizations and their mentorship programs. Uh, and then in my personal work, I do a lot of freelance photography these days. So either I do freelance video or stills um, and then a ton of photo editing. Uh, I started my career as a daily staff shooter on newspapers, but then eventually went into photo editing. And probably for the last 10 years, I've been more of a manager and editor. That's really interesting. So I guess you're sort of coming at it with quite a few different perspectives because you've got sort of the the perspective of of being a photographer um, on the ground, doing the work, creating the work, um, also editing, and then also mentoring. So how how I guess how have those different perspectives influenced your own practice? Yeah, that that's actually a really good question. Uh, sometimes I think a lot of times with editors who haven't had they experience as a as a daily staffer or a, or a freelancer there's this thing that happens in newsrooms where you'll have a preconceived image in your head and you'll kind of expect whoever you hire to make that image but i think when you've done the job from both sides uh i, I say like both sides of the desk like i've been the one receiving assignments but i've also been the one managing and giving out assignments and i think that gives you a different perspective it makes you kind of anticipate some of the hurdles in advance uh, and also just be more of a collaborator rather than a person who is saying, why didn't this image match what I thought it was going to look like when you got there? Uh, you know, when having done that job from the other side, like, you know, that things don't always go as planned or that once you're on site, the idea you had in your head about what to expect wasn't exactly what's happening. And, and being a good journalist is kind of, you know, questioning and being open to that and adjusting on the fly. And I think a lot of times if you don't have that infield experience, you don't know what you don't know. Like, it's not that you're you're bad for not knowing it. It's just that you you just never had to think about it. So why would you even know to ask that question? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. And then as well, I guess, in terms of your own freelance practice at the minute as a photographer, how has your, your experience being a, a photo editor maybe shaped also the way that you interact with photo editors or the, the way that you approach those conversations? I think, I think it goes back to that idea of knowing what questions to ask um, and, and just leaning on your experience a little bit. Like I could think about times where I've run into hurdles on my as an editor and as a daily photographer. Um, and I also do a lot of video as well. So there's a whole other realm of, of issues that come up when you're working in audio and moving images. And, and I think the big thing is you, you kind of know how to 
almost like a pre-production cycle. Like you kind of know how to think about, okay, what are the things that I need to be asking? What are the things that I need to be preparing for? And then what are the contingencies? Because if this goes the way that that one assignment I remember from three years ago went, then I know I need to be prepared for X, Y, Z, right? So you're leaning on that experience. And I think that's kind of the real strength is when you have that experience behind you to know, oh yeah, I, I can lean on something where I learned a lesson in the past that will be applicable here. Or I've dealt with somebody who might have been, you know, an editor who had a preconceived idea that was upset with what you turned in until you explained like, you know, the idea you had in your head was maybe not accurate with reality. And that's not just like, it. the scene didn't look the way I thought it would look. It's more like sometimes people have ideas of what should the situation look like or what is the, it's almost like a trope. It's like you have this idea in your head of like, this person should look a certain way or this scene should look a certain way or the atmosphere should match up with some movie I saw about this topic years ago. And it's like, well, that that's a hyper-realistic version of reality. That's not real. <laughs> and when you're working with the good editor, I think it becomes that collaboration where you feel like you can say these things. I think, you know, the other challenge with working as an editor, is sometimes you, you have to recognize there's a power dynamic. Like as an editor, I, I if I'm, I'm a bad editor, if I don't recognize that I am not, I'm creating this power dynamic that is not letting the person I'm working with surface these concerns. And then in the long run, it hurts all of us. So as as a person who's then receiving assignments, if you know how to navigate that conversation to bring it up in a way that doesn't make that person feel like they're being attacked or defensive, you get a lot more mileage out of it. Totally. I think that's all really valuable to hear. And I guess the reason in particular why I was sort of wanting to ask you about those sort of difficult conversations sometimes that you might have with an editor um, is I think that that's something that comes up a lot when we're thinking about ethics or when we're thinking about time. You know, I think a lot of a lot, one of the big themes I think that's come out of several of these uh, podcast episodes is the importance of having enough time to sort of do due diligence on a lot of these maybe potential ethical dilemmas that can emerge. And having those conversations with editors, I think, can be a real barrier for people about not having enough time or or even just navigating different ethical dilemmas that that do emerge. Have you how have you navigated that or do you have any examples that you could share to that effect? Oh, absolutely. As as you're asking me your question, I was nodding my head of like, which story can I share without naming names? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I, I I think first there's a couple of things I think. Time, 100%. I think as a freelancer, as a person who gets assignments, you always want more time. You want more time to prepare. You want more time to learn about the subject. The worst thing, the worst feeling is when you learn about an assignment and you only have like a few hours, it's the same day, or it could be the next morning. And it's a very, and you don't have a lot of information, right? Like you might get an assignment that says, go to this place, photograph this event or portrait of somebody. And the first questions you should be asking is like, well, what's the story? Like if I'm if I'm, for instance, a portrait, right? Like if I'm taking a portrait of somebody, a really surface level editor might say, oh, go get a picture of that person. And that's it. But you don't know what the story is about. Like, how do you compose this person? What kind of lighting do you use? You know, what is the tone of the image? Like, you don't want to come back with a smiling photo of someone who's dealing with tragedy and then find out that that person is like, why did you, I'm talking about these horrible things and you got this smiley photo of me. Why did you do that to me? And as the freelancer, if you never knew what the story was, you know, first you feel like you feel awful because it's like, I I really messed up here, right? I completely got the story wrong. But the issue wasn't that I did something wrong, really. It's, It's because I didn't have a full understanding of the story. And the challenge there was time, right? No time to ask questions, no time to prepare, no time to even um, get your head wrapped around like, how am I going to approach this assignment? Like you're just kind of in reaction mode because of that power dynamic also, like you don't want to fail, right? If an editor calls you as a freelancer, you're always worried about like, this could be my last assignment if I don't do good by this editor. Like, because at the end of the day, the editors, if you, from their perspective, they kind of, they're kind of taking a chance on you every time they call you because they're, they're saying, I trust this person. I believe this person can do the work. I want to support this person. I'm going to give them assignment. But if, if you come back with quote unquote, a failure, it affects not only the freelancer, but it also affects the editor because then they have to go up the chain to their bosses and bosses and bosses and say, you know, the page designer is upset, their editor is upset, the writer is upset. And it's hard to defend that 
And so a lot of times what happens is people don't get a call back for a while and you won't ever know why because you can't really say why, but that's kind of what's usually happening in those cases. And so there's a challenge on both sides, right? Like from the editor's perspective, they're dealing with some challenges. And then from the freelancer's perspective, they're also dealing with their own challenges, but it all comes down to a lot of times time, right? You need, need the time to prepare properly, to understand the story properly. And and so I'm thinking like, you know, what are some examples of this? Like I've definitely had, uh, I've definitely had times, like I, I think of one time I sent somebody out to rule, I think it was Pennsylvania during the campaign trail for, for uh, Hillary and Trump the first time. So what was that, 2016, I think? Uh, whatever year that was, someone fact check me who's <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> uh, it was the first, it was that campaign trail. And so we went to rural Pennsylvania for an assignment and I sent out a photographer and talked, and I, and I said to them, you know, I talked to them about the story and I said, you know, I don't want you to go into this with any baggage around you, like about what we're expecting. I like, I hired you because I trust you and I believe in you. And I know that you can tell this story. Um, they were a little younger in their career. And so I wanted to kind of like guide them as, but also not just give them too many parameters of like, do it this way or do it that way. So we talked it through for a couple of days before they went out. And I made sure to get them that assignment about three days before they went out to to actually work on it. And so during those three days, we were able to talk it through of ask me your questions or let's talk about what we might expect when we get there. And that, I think, helped a lot in the long run because then it let them kind of feel like, you know, you can stretch a little bit. You, you don't have to go for that image in your head that you've seen a thousand times before uh, trying to match some trope that you've seen. Uh, you know, a lot of times you see images coming from rural parts of the country and they look a certain way, right? Like, you know, there's the same images of a broken tractor or open fields or farmers looking dusty and covered up with grit. And it's just kind of like, well, that that's like this trope we have in our head of like what that part of the world looks like. But the reality, if you go there and spend a little bit of time there, is like, yes, there's a small section of that community that is that trope, but there's like, it's like an iceberg. There's like below the surface of the water, there's like 90% of that iceberg that you're not seeing that is much more complex and probably looks a lot more familiar than you would think going into it. So those are the kind of conversations we were having before we went into that assignment. And I, I got to say, she did an amazing job. She spent uh, a week down there after that, came back with like really nuanced, really deep, non-cliched images and brought those back to me. And I was so happy to see her do well. But also, like, you know, she she had this new confidence, which was nice as an editor to see, like, the people you're championing for um, do well, but also feel well about the work they did. Not not that they're just turning it in to get paid, but they actually feel good about it as well. Um, but then flipping it now. So now, as an editor, I have this body of work that I'm happy with and the person that I worked with is happy with. But the images we created don't match this preconceived stereotypical trope that a lot of times rural parts of the country are seen as. So now as an editor, my challenge then becomes taking it to, to the next three people up the chain from me to say, yes, we should run these. And this is, this is the one I think should run as a double truck and big and, you know, and making that case for that. And the immediate response being, why doesn't this look the way I thought it would look? Or I don't like these images. But then you and then you push a little bit like, okay, let's articulate it for me. Like, let me understand. Like, what are you not liking about it? And as you start unpacking it with them, you're hoping that in that process they realize on their own without you being the bad guy of like, you're kind of being, a, you're othering a lot of people and you're not recognizing that you're doing it because you never had to think about it. And so having time for those conversations is how you get to a better result. So hundred percent time is so vital, but it's also the most precious resource and the hardest one to get. A lot of times you'll get a call because an editor has just found out about a story that a writer has been working on for weeks or months, very last minute. And that's just the reality. And so a lot of times in the newsroom, I think from the freelancer side, if you haven't ever worked as an editor or a manager, you might not realize it that that's the situation the editor is in. Like I've, I've worked as a DOP and I think a lot of times when I was as a DOP, a lot of freelancers would think, oh, you know, Schmitter is the one making the final call. He's like, he's like the photo god of that newsroom. He, whatever he says goes. And the reality is very far from it. Like I still have levels of management above me that I have to convince that visuals are A, important and B, 
I know what I'm talking about and see it's like, okay, I know that image you had in your head isn't what you're seeing, but trust me, like this is what we should do. And here's why. And the thing that I, and the thing is always just like, how, how do you articulate that to, to in a way that doesn't make power structure feel challenged because then you become labeled the troublemaker and then it's hard to get anything done. <laughs> Like, this is all so interesting. And I think it reminds me a lot of a question that I think we keep coming back to in this podcast as well is like, whose responsibility is it to sort of change the visual narrative and to challenge these tropes and stereotypes? Like, is it the photographer? Is it the editor? Is it the audience? Like, like I, I think probably the answer is, is it's all of us. But I don't know. Do you have a different answer to that? Or how would you respond to that? I think it's, I mean, I think you're on the nose. It's it's a combination of all of it. And it's a, it's a little bit of, it's media literacy on our part of teaching our audience how to see what we're actually seeing on the ground. Um, to read beyond a headline, for instance, like if it's a written article, like how do you get beyond the headline? The headline is like five words and then people kind of read that. And we see it on social media all the time. Like you read a headline and then you look at the comments under under that on a social media chain. And it's like all these comments that are either completely false, because if you read the story, you know that what they're saying is not true. Or it's just like people saying, well, did you read the article? That was in there. That was in there. And so like, I think there's a lot of media literacy that has to happen of like, what is the value of this? Like, you know, another thing we see a lot is people complaining about paywalls. And it's and it's like, you know, I, I, can someone copy and paste this for me? Because it's behind of a paywall. I hate the New York Times for that, or I hate the Washington Post for that, or whatever it is, right? The Atlantic. I see those kind of comments a lot. And and I I think this this part of it is that media literacy part of like, we need to do a better job of sharing as an industry, not just photojournalism, but journalism in general is just, we have to do a much, much better job of kind of explaining what a journalist does, but also what is the value of what we do? Like, when I was coming up in journalism school, like we talk about this idea of the fourth estate and like, what is that? And like, there's a generation just before me, like the Gen X of journalists who are growing up in that time of Watergate and they see this purpose to journalism, but then you get beyond that generation. And I think it's changed because information has always been free. We've grown up with the internet. Uh, there's always somebody rephrasing something uh, you know, Reddit's too long, didn't read is kind of like the normal of the internet now. Like I only want to read two sentences or a headline. Uh, and I think part of that is that we haven't done a good job of even explaining what do we do? What is our, what is our value to society? Like, what are we, uh, you know, and I'm going to get off track here a little bit, but you know, the rise of cable news to me is a big problem with that. Cause I think it's really changed people's perception of what cable news is. I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that, 24 hour news channels have were the worst thing that happened to journalism because, and it's not against anything for the people that work on these publications and TV stations. It's more that there is just not 24 hours worth of news to cover in a day. And so what you end up doing is filling it in with a version of talk radio. So it's just opinions everywhere. And I think that blurred the line for a lot of people where it's like, I don't know what journalists do because it seems like you just spout opinions and it's just one talking head after another. And I think that blurred the line between what is editorial and what is opinion. So there's like a whole realm there to deal with, right? Like how do you improve media literacy? How do you show the value of what we do? But then the other side of it is that that chain of how do you change the norms for the news gathering side, like the journalists, the editors, the managers. And I think part of that is as journalists, we, I've said this in a lot of newsrooms I've worked with is you know, we're in the business of communicating, but we are horrible at communicating with each other. I don't know what it is, but when you're in a newsroom, communication is, it's, it's almost like you need to over communicate, but we don't. And I don't know why that's the case, but I feel like if we embrace that idea of, we need to talk more, we need to share ideas more. We also need to value each other's opinions more. It doesn't need to feel like there's some kind of hierarchy with, uh, well, that reporter who spent six months on that story knows way more than anybody else. Well, Maybe they do. They probably do. They definitely do. They spent more time with it. But I think the photographer that you pair them with is it needs to be a collaborator, not in service of that writer. And I think that's a dynamic that needs to be addressed. And I think some places are making that attempt, but I've seen it time and time again where the photographer is brought in very late in the game. Again, going back to that theme of time. And then by that point, 
you're not treated as a collaborator, but like as a service department. Um, I always used to say it's like a, I felt like a deli counter sometimes as an editor. It's like, I get a reporter that says, I got this assignment due in a day. Can you get me a picture of this? And then when you say, well, why do you think that's the picture you want? Tell me what the story is. <laughs> like, like, don't call, don't call me up and say like, I'm a butcher You're saying, can I get five pounds of misery today? Like, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're collaborators and we're looking out for each other and we're always trying to do what's in the best service of the reader or the viewer, like what's going to help their understanding? What's going to help our readers, our viewers have a better understanding of what's happening in the world, what they, what matters to them, how is it relevant to them so that they can make better choices for themselves and their communities. Like that's the goal at the end of the day. It's not about my ego or your ego or this manager's having a bad day. It's like at the end of the day, what we do here matters because it has long lasting impact. Like it can change literally literally change laws like literally change us government policy community policy school boards can vote different ways neighbors can rally together around causes just based on learning more about the world but also if it goes wrong it can go really wrong as well like we've seen this with how misinformation has been weaponized and that's not a prank that's like a weapon like you are doing it because you want to move the public towards something Either you're just trying to confuse everybody so much that no decision can be made, or you are trying to get everyone to make the decision that is aligned with what you want as the, as the power holder, or just the wrong decision because you you just don't want people to do what's right for themselves. And we see this time and time again as well. So I, I think at the end of the day, it's kind of remembering like what is the bigger purpose of it all and then working together and over communicating the heck out of it. So like just everything just value everyone's opinion and just keep sharing and talking it because i think there are so many blind spots that get emerged in those conversations yeah definitely and there's something in particular that i, I kind of want to go back to that you mentioned you're talking about um how these lines are really blurred between editorial and like what is editorial and what is opinion and also that people often don't really understand journalism. And I, I completely agree with that. Like, I'm, I'm not a journalist, but I see that a lot. I work with a lot of photojournalists and, and I see that more and more in conversations that I have with people, the more that I'm becoming um, more and more aware and the more that I understand journalism as an industry. And I'm, I'm sort of seeing that gulf more and more. But then I think it's also kind of complicated by a bit of a transition that I think is happening. And correct me if I'm wrong or, or if you see this differently, but I feel like there's also this transition happening, this sort of post-positivist um, approach to journalism as well, where it's sort of saying like, we aren't necessarily objective either though. Like we, we play a role and we have um, a very important role to play as journalists, but there's this sort of increasing understanding, I think of the fallacy of objectivity. So how does that sit? Yeah, that that is a really heady, heady question because this is something I've grabbed. No, 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 no. It's heady questions are great. It's a great way to start our morning. Uh, this question about is objectivity actually achievable in, or is it a, a myth, a fallacy? Uh, I think that's something I've grappled with a lot. Early in my career, I think I believed that there is objectivity and you can remove yourself from the situation and kind of see it from a from all perspectives and like, and not, not like represent both sides, but like try to make sure you recognize perspectives and start asking the right questions. But I think as I've progressed in my career from those early days to actually doing the work for real for like, you know, over a decade, almost two decades now, I think I've kind of landed in the latter camp of like true objectivity. It's, it is a little bit of a myth and it's built on a legacy power structure and that power structure kind of decided like what is objective. And so having the ability to now step back and say, wait, how did we, how did we reach this point where we decided this is objective to earth and what led to those decisions and what are the parts that, like what are the steps in that process? And once you start unpacking it a little bit, you start realizing that a lot of it is based on just like, you know, s somewhere in our industry, a certain group of people at some point decided these are norms. This is truth. And there were other voices that were kind of relegated to more of a more of that stereotypical trope 
space where it's like, well, that's what those people think or that those people don't know the whole story and I do. Like that kind of attitude. It, it's, it's hard because I think like on paper you want to say, well, yeah, objective is a binary, right? Like it can't, it can't be both true and untrue at the same time. But when you start doing it in reality, you start realizing true, true objective is true. But, but once you start involving humans in that decision making of objectivity, it, it gets very skewed very quickly. I know I'm, I'm probably talking a little obtusely, but it's, it's a really hard thing to kind of grasp when you start thinking about stepping back from the actual word to like, what does it mean? It's like that idea of intention versus interpretation. Like when I work, when you work on a story, like if I work on a story, my intention might be A, but once it gets published, people come to it new and they interpret it as B. It, and it's completely missed the mark from what I was intending for it, right? So is that still objective at some point? Like, is is their understanding of taking the story as meaning B, where my intention was A, does that mean that I was objectively wrong or they're objectively wrong? And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I really like what you said about, you know, not approaching it as necessarily a binary of something being objective or not being objective. I think that's really, I think that's a really useful approach. It's really, I mean, it's really complex. I know it's really, but it's really interesting. I've really appreciated hearing your approach to that and your take on that. Yeah. Um, and also how you described that you sort of shifted in your own approach and understanding of objectivity or the limits of objectivity in journalism. And something else that I wanted to ask you about um, that sort of goes back to what you're talking about, I think about media literacy, um, was something that I really noticed because obviously we, well, obviously not, it's obvious to us, but not to the listener, I guess. Um, we were both on the uh, ethics panel for the Environmental Photographer of the Year Award. And on that panel, something that I really noticed that you kept bringing up and was something that maybe I was much less attuned to was uh, the wording of captions. And I thought that that was really interesting. And it really, I really learned a lot from you in that process and sort of how I'm reading captions and the assumptions that are written into captions. I feel like I've, I've worked on developing that kind of awareness visually, but I, I, I think I'd forgotten a little bit about captions. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm actually a big strickler for, for good captions. That's why I noticed them a lot. Uh, it's probably a product of how my career progressed. So when I first started out, and I'm going to rewind a little bit, there was this thing called backpack journalist that doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, the concept was you would be a single journalist who would go out and write a story, photograph a story, do a video of a story, and then work with designers to like design a print package around a story. So you were kind of responsible for all parts of it. And that that made me really think about writing you know, like, how am I presenting my work beyond the visual image or, or the video? But, like, what am I packaging around it? What are the words, the captions, but also the story? Like, what is the SEO going to use to find my story? Those kind of things. And so I think that really changed my framing of how I think about captions. And to me, when I look at captions around a visual, it's another clue into the intention of the person creating that work. Like, what do they think the story is? It's another chance for them also to give me more context for what am I looking at. I, I think also as an editor, I got a little frustrated sometimes when I would work with mostly European photographers. I, I don't know what it is about people who, who are working in the European spaces, but there was this, always this attitude of the image should stand on its own. It doesn't need a caption the photo should speak for itself. Like that was a common mantra. And I would have to push back on that a lot because I would talk to these photographers and say, look, one, A, we're, we're doing journalism. We have to have a caption. But two, a caption is your opportunity to give more context to this story, to almost add like another chapter of understanding to what is this image trying to tell me? Because again, going back to that idea of intention versus interpretation, right? Like if you are intending something, well, here's yet another chance for you to clarify that for us. Here's another chance for you to almost like media literacy, like teach people how to look at your image. Who are the people in it? If you don't know their names, then I start questioning, you know, are you, are you a picture maker or a picture taker? And what I mean by that is, are you a person who drops in and makes it about themselves to just kind of like, I got to get this image because I got to meet my deadline or I got to make my portfolio better or I'm 
trying to get my name out there or I want so I want 100 likes on Instagram like whatever like you then you're a picture taker like you're taking from somewhere and if you're a picture maker you're approaching it differently you're you're collaborating with the people you're working with not not like collaborating as in the traditional idea of come to the table let's figure out how we're going to make this picture together but you are showing that respect like of their time for you of the access they're giving you um, you are being you're not you're not trying to make it positive for them, but you are saying thank you for allowing me into your world. Thank you for letting me sit in here and ask questions and observe and like learn something that I did not know about before uh, or challenge my own assumptions or create this dialogue where you were able to challenge my assumptions if you noticed I was doing something. Like a lot of times when I go work with people, one of the first things I say during an interview is, hey, at any point, if there's a question I'm asking that you don't feel comfortable with, like we can pause. You just, you can tell me you had that permission. You know, you can also stop anytime you want. Like I let them, I let them know very early that the power dynamic is you're in charge. You're, you're giving me permission to be here. You're, you are also empowered to tell me if something is making you uncomfortable or if I am asking questions based on stereotypes that I'm not aware of. I need you to tell me that because I won't know any other way that I've messed up here. And if we don't establish that with each other, then I will walk away perpetuating more harm and amplifying this signal of stereotypes unless you educate me. And so I think a lot of that, when I say picture maker, it's like that collaboration, that that's the kind of collaboration I'm talking about. It's like creating that open space and making it very clear for that person that you are grateful for being there and then they are sharing something with you. They are giving something to you when you're there. And I think that goes a long way in shaping how you tell these stories later as well. Totally. And I think that that was something that really struck me as well when we were looking at some of the photographs and reading some of the captions was that a lot of captions were written stating what we were looking at. But you were constantly asking, how does the photographer know that? And I thought that was really interesting because I found myself sort of accepting that uh, the caption, you know, accepting that that was that they knew that and mm. that they had verified that. But I think you'd really you really pushed on that, that like, how do they actually know? Like, how do we know that they know what they're telling us? And I thought that, that was really, really interesting. I think that gets that. Yeah. The um, maybe that sort of relationship building that you're talking about that I think is also can be quite evident in the resulting images. But I think yeah. thinking about that in the caption as well was really something that um, I hadn't I hadn't done as much thinking about. I thought that was really useful. Yeah. I, I mean, I think in the situation we were in, because we were an ethics panel, like we are, we're a safeguard, right? At the end of the day, we are there to help that contest, make sure that we are evaluating everything as an ethics panel, we are we are asking those questions that need to be asked. And sometimes the answers are, well, we know it because of this, right? Like if I said, how does this photographer know that this person that they're taking a photograph is actually going through this horrible situation? Because what I'm looking at doesn't match what you're telling me. And the answer could be, well, because I spent a day with them and they took me to their home and they told, they shared this story with me. And I, and I realized in the story that, yes, they're going through a hard thing, but they're a very proud person. Like they don't feel horrible about their situation and they think one day they'll get out of it. And so this is why I photographed them the way I did, because that's who they are. Like they're a proud person who's trying to get through a horrible situation, but the horrible situation isn't who they are. Like that's not the whole character. That makes a lot of sense because I'm like, okay. I now know why you have taken that photograph the way you did. But I also know that you went and took the time to understand what is the story. Like, I'm not just putting out an image in a certain way because it because I think it'll win a contest. Right. And I think when I'm looking when I'm looking at things like that, I'm looking I'm like a, an investigator. I'm, it's almost like forensics. Like I'm looking for clues. I'm looking at the captions and I'm thinking, OK, this caption's only got five words in it. What does that tell me about their intention on this photograph? What does this tell me about the maybe the person who wrote this photograph? Like, I mean, wrote this caption. Like, do they care enough? And it could also be me putting my assumptions on it. I mean, there could be language barriers, and that's maybe that's just the best that they felt confident putting in there. But I think it's important as an ethics panel to 
to ask those questions because if we we need to need clarity for ourselves. We can't just assume that like even that example of like, oh, maybe there's a language barrier and someone's English isn't as good, so they did the best they could. I think that is that is still fair to ask because okay, now I understand. That's that's how we got here. Great. I have that context. Now I have a fuller understanding of who the person was, what their intentions were, what photograph they created, what the story they were trying to tell was. Like it's giving me more context clues. I wanted to ask you as well about your um, experience as a mentor, because you said that you, well, I guess also even as a, as a photo editor, you are also mentoring in a, in a certain way the, the photographers that you're working with. But you did mention at the start as well that you do quite a lot of mentorship. And I guess I was wondering if you could maybe share with us what would be sort of key advice that you would impart to, to photographers, especially in the sort of area of ethics. So a lot of times, I mean, one, there's no one size fits all. Everyone is different and everyone is different parts of their journey and struggling with maybe different questions. So I can't really say like, here's a one size fits all, but maybe another way for me to answer this might be thinking about my own experiences of like, okay, if I was going to go back (laughs) when I was starting, what do I wish I kind of had known or advice I wish I had gotten? And for me, I think that might've been... And this could this could also apply for the people I, I work with. But I, I think the part of it is that you have to get beyond that idea of being happy to be in the room, if that makes sense. It's like when you're starting out, I think a lot of times you're just going with the flow and you're trying to not make waves and you're just kind of happy to be in the room and you feel privileged to be in the room. You kind of go with things that you maybe don't feel good about or you don't ask the questions that you feel like you should have asked. So like an example might be, and this is a real, this is a real thing that happened. You know, an editor might have put a word in a headline that you, that you have a problem with, like, and you know that there's baggage around that word. And in your, in your early career, you might not bring it up because you're just like, I'm happy to be in the room. I don't want to be a troublemaker. I want to keep moving in my career. But when you've done it a while and you feel less scared to speak up, that's when you can start saying, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't say that word and here's why. But I think that's the challenge. It's like, how do you how do you get to that point where, you know, you're not too afraid to speak up? And I, that's the hardest thing because everyone is different. But I think for myself, that was the thing I wish I learned earlier. So so I, I am, this is audio, so you can't see me, but I'm sure from my name, you've guessed that <laughs> I'm not a cis male white man. Uh, <laughs> but I've always been, I've always been, so I'm Indian, but I'm also Sikh. So I'm a minority within a minority. And in America in the 90s, I was not, nobody else looked like me. Like my brother and I were the only ones who were Indian in our entire elementary school and middle school. It wasn't until high school that other people were there. But when you have that perspective on the world of always being told that you're different or you're you're another, you start seeing the world from a different perspective. And I, I think a lot of times in my early career, I wish I had spoken up more because I was seeing things from a different perspective. A lot of times I walk in a room, even today, and there are things that we just accept as true or as the norms. And my first question is always like, why do we do it that way? And how do we know that that's the right way to do it? And the usual answer is like, well, that's how we have always done it. I was like, yeah, but like, why do we think that? that? That goes back to that objectivity idea, right? It's like, well, that's how we've always done it. Yeah, but is that actually objective truth or is that just how we've always done it and we've gotten used to it? You know, because you never had another voice in the room that said, wait a minute. <laughs> and so I think a lot of times that's the advice I would probably give to to younger people is, you know, it's a very subjective thing we work in. So don't be, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, and that's probably the other lesson I give a lot of people that I work with that are younger is you'll show your portfolio to 10 editors and you'll get 10 different opinions. So take it all with a grain of salt. Don't forget who you are in the process. Don't forget that you can also speak up and ask questions. And I, I guess the last thing would just be journalism is a very small world. So just don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there's something really interesting as well, though, about what you're saying with, you know, I feel like you've used the word troublemaker a few times. And I think that's so interesting, that idea that, you know, you don't want to rock the boat and the idea Mm -hmm. that to rock the boat 
is negative and somewhere it's mm-hmm. it's acting out and it's not what you should be doing. And I think that's really interesting. And I think yeah. that's also brilliant advice to, you know, push past that. And it's not easy. Like that that idea of it's something I still struggle with. Like I have to sometimes remind myself, like, no Schminner, stop it. You're 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 kind of going with the flow because you don't want to make waves, but is this the right thing? And I think I, for me anyway, I go back to that idea of something I was saying earlier. Uh, what is the purpose of this, right? If we if we say journalism is the fourth estate and it's got this higher purpose, then we need to also honor that responsibility. And and not speaking up is going against that responsibility, right? So sometimes I have to hike myself up a little bit, be like, no, no, if you don't say something, you could do a lot of harm. Like this newsroom could do a lot of harm without even realizing what they're doing. And then you'll wish you said something. And so there are ways to to say something. Like what I do is I will pull people aside for a one-on-one chat because I'm not trying to score points with other people seeing what I'm doing. I'm just trying to get to the best outcome. And the be- And for what I've learned over my career is if I pull somebody off one-on-one and say, hey, can I just talk to you for a second? There's something that's not sitting right with me. And let's just talk it through. If it's like a one-on-one intimate conversation on the side, I often find that the person I'm talking with doesn't have to feel like they have to defend themselves and they don't have to feel like agreeing with me is them losing. And I feel like if I do it in public, then that's usually the dynamic that ends up. And in the long run, we get to the better place and I'm happy because I'm like, great, I was heard. This person has now recognized something that they were doing that maybe was a blind spot that they will now hopefully think about going forward. They also know that I'm not trying to get them or something, that they can come to me with questions or help in the future. And and that's all positive. I think that's why I do it that way, because I'm just after the end result of like, how do we get to that good place? And how do we start doing better things and improving our journalism? I think the challenge sometimes as an editor is people don't see that work and (laughs) because you're doing it privately and that and that that makes it a little difficult to kind of signal to other people that like, hey, I'm here and you can come talk to me as well. And like, we can do this together. Absolutely. And I, I really like what you said there as well about, you know, you're not doing it to score points. And I think that that's sometimes where ethical conversations can break down is that I think sometimes that is the dynamic or that's perceived to be the dynamic. That I think it's perceived. Yeah. yeah. Because you're putting people on the defensive, right? So yeah. they're perceiving that they're, they feel like they're being attacked and, They probably deserve to be attacked, but maybe they (laughs) deserve to be attacked in a way that's... Well, and attacked is a very strong word, but challenged. They deserve to be challenged, but they deserve to be challenged in the way that says, come around to asking the questions if you're uncomfortable to me one-on-one. I will make that space for you. And let's let's together just agree. Like, hey, we're we're both on the same page. Like, we want to make the end result better. Like, we don't... You know, when I said there's a responsibility to journalism, part of that responsibility is do not perpetuate harm. Like, do not just keep repeating the sin, the sins of the past and furthering that harm, you know, because you haven't ever had to think about it. And I think we've seen this a lot in the last, uh, you know, we've definitely seen it a lot in the last five years uh, after George Floyd and the, the second wave of Black Lives Matter. But I think a lot of people forget that, Trayvon Martin was the first wave of Black Lives Matter. And we tried to have these conversations then, but the world wasn't ready for it yet. And I think there's a positive and negative way to look for it, right? Like you can look at that first wave and think, well, that failed. But I would look, I would argue it's the opposite. I think that first wave primed us to be ready for the real conversation to come later. And that's when the real change actually happened because now people were more open to actually changing. And that's, and, and it's a little horrible to think that people have to go through these horrible things to to get to this point. And, and history is full of horrible things like that. But I think if we can try to like walk that line in the middle that just says, okay, I know, but what is the good thing we could take from this? Like, how do we push this boulder in the right direction? Um, you know, like, can we make this one degrees change that will get us in a better place 10 years from now versus wanting to get there today because we society isn't always ready to move as fast as some of us would like it to move. So one thing I like to ask all of the guests on the podcast is what does photography ethics mean to you? I've been thinking about this because uh, 
I knew I knew this question was coming because I've listened to a couple of podcasts. And I think for me, the answer is, at the end of the day, are you proud to put your name on this? Do you feel like you did right that day? Ethics is like, kind of like objectivity. It's not a binary and it's always changing. It's always evolving. It's a living creature in a lot of ways. Ethics today are very different than what they were 20 years ago. Um, same as objectivity, same as our, our norms in the newsroom. And, and I think ethics, it's that higher, it's that higher purpose. Like, okay, are you doing right by the responsibility of, of the journalism? Like, have you done your due diligence? Have you avoided perpetuating harm? Have you avoided stereotypes? Have you made time for the people that you're working with to fully understand what the story is? Have you advocated when you felt like you should have? Did you not stay silent because you were afraid of making waves? I, I think ethics are all part of that. It's just, it's like character. It's like at the end of the day, all that comes together and your byline is on it. Do you sleep okay at night? And like, if, if you're feeling like you did everything right and you heard from all voices and you put something out in the world that actually helps people understand something better or to make a better decision for them themselves and their family or their country, I think then that's a win. So ethics is like this living nebulous creature. I think it's always evolving. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Photo Ethics Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to share new insights about photography ethics with others. So if you heard something you liked, please share this podcast with someone who would appreciate it. You can also rate and review us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Join me next week when we hear from Margaret Mitchell on connection and sincerity. In each episode of the podcast, we ask our guests, what does photography ethics mean to you? This is a question that everyone in the photography industry should be able to answer. That's why the Photography Ethics Center is asking you, our listeners, to commit to writing and publishing your own statement of ethics. Visit www.photoethics.org ethics to learn more and to make the pledge committing to ethical transparency, accountability, and awareness. That's www.photoethics.org slash ethics.